I'm Christine. Welcome to Book Talk. Today we're discussing In Amber in the Ashes by Sabata here. Which is our book explosion May Book of the Month. Yeah. So as I've said, this month we've been working with Penguin and an Ember in the Ashes. It's our Mave Explosion book of the month. Hashtag Ember Explosion. Hashtag Emberlicious. I just finished the book. And before this, like months before this, I had been given the opportunity to go to the set and watch them shoot the book trailer and meet Saba. If you haven't seen the book trailer yet, you can click here and watch it. But yeah, I got to see them filming that. I just finished Ember and it was so good. I've been in a reading slump. Like I literally only read the book of the month last month. And Ember in the Ashes was just so refreshing. I found myself just sitting and reading for hours and I haven't done that in so long. Even when I read Confess, it was a really quick read so it wasn't like sitting and reading forever. I just sat and read this and got the audiobook so I was also listening to it in the car and then I'd read it wherever I was and I was just like, I haven't read for fun to this extent in so long and I just really, really enjoyed myself. If you don't know what it's about, okay, it's told from two point of view. The first is Laia and it's all in this fantasy realm that's kind of based out of ancient Rome. So there are augurs who like tell the future. When when it comes down to it, it's about two characters. It's about Laia and it's about Elias. The book, in retrospect, is really hard to explain. Like, I don't know where I'm going with this explanation. Just trust me, it's awesome. I'm rating it five out of five stars. I give it 95%. I really, really enjoyed it. This book was pitched as a standalone, right? <laughs> This is so not a standalone. This is not a standalone. I finished the book. I'm just, this is not a standalone. This book wraps up, but like it leaves a million new questions for next book. Penguin, I hope you pick up that second book. I'm sure they will. It was like number one or number two on the bestsellers list last week. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. So I'm sure we're gonna get a second book. I'm really excited about it. Guys, it's so cool. It kicks ass some aspects of it. Reminded me of Percy Jackson, just like the augers, really. It focuses a lot on the characters. And there's these trials to crown a new emperor and the trials kind of reminded me of a really effed up version of the Triwizard Tournament. And I don't want to spoil anything. So you just got to read it. All the chapters end on like a cliffhanger and you're like, I must get to the next chapter, but it switches point of views and then both point of views are cliffhangers and it's weaving together. And I love it. And there's some romance going on, but it's just enough to like keep you really excited about it but not overwhelm you. In conclusion, it was awesome. Hashtag I'm delicious. I'm excited for book two. I need to get myself a hardcover. The Book Explosion crew and I are going to be having a live show on my channel Saturday, June 6th at 7 p.m. EST. Hopefully you read it by then and we can all discuss it together live. Okay, that's it for the non-spoiler section, okay? If you haven't read the book yet, you gotta go now. You gotta leave and read it. Bye. I was listening to the audiobook for this. Like, I read from here and I listened to the audiobook, like, when I was in the car and such. They have English accents in there, like, some of them do. Is it just the reader who's doing that to, you know, help us know which character is which? Or is the cook Irish? Is he had, like, a Manchester ish English accent, like a Northern English accent? And Laya was just like, Laya, Laya, Laya. Maybe a slight English accent on her? No, Elias didn't have much of an accent. But some of his fellow friends did. Interesting. So did we love Elias? He really grew on me. The whole mask thing creeps me out to no end. I just want them all to take out their masks. I love Helene. Picturing her with a silver face creeps me out to no end. So can you see like their emotions through it? Is there like a hole for their mouth? I'm assuming there's a hole for their mouth. How does it work? Does it like meld around it? What about their nose? It's scary. I don't like thinking about it. Their whole training regime like Let's drop them in the desert for four years when they're eight years old. It's not cool. The world and how it divided into <laughs> scholars versus military humans. We didn't concentrate so much on that. We concentrated more on the plight at hand rather than the backstory, but I'm interested in it. I was a little rocky explaining the book because I was trying to explain the initial premise, but I'm not exactly sure about it. But I don't care because everything else was so good. Blackcliff has this weird thing for every generation, they only allow one female fighter, one female mask. And this generation is Helene. And Helene is this like extreme version of Hermione to me. Follow the rules, fantastic at everything she does, she kicks ass, she's best friends with our protagonist, but she follows the rules to like a fault. <laughs> She's just trusting the augurs with everything ever. I know she made a deal. Elias will live if you swear allegiance to the new empire. So she just kept doing everything because she was like, Elias is going to live because they said so. But like, she was like a half, a middle, half an inch away from chopping Elias' head off. I know she had good intentions, but that was a little too close for comfort, girl. Despite that though, I really liked her character. I completely sympathized with her, the way she's feeling about Elias. Oh, she was like, you think I want to feel this way? Like it's been the worst thing that's ever happened to me that I feel this way, but I do. I don't know how Elias feels about her. He does feel 
little something and I wish they had that kiss just so we could have a sense of how they're feeling together. We never get that because they never go there. They never cross the line into romanticism. We see with Laia, it seems like she's going for Elias. It seems like Elias will be endgame, not Keenan. I don't know if you pronounce his name Keenan. I think you do. But every time I say it, I'm like, Keenan and Kel. I can't not think of Keenan and Kel. Do you know Keenan and Kel? If you don't, you know Keenan from SNL, right? Him. But he doesn't look like him at all. He's like ginger. He looks Irish. I don't ship Lainan and I don't ship Elias. I ship Elias. Elias, their names go together so well. Or Elia, hashtag Elia is, hashtag Elia. So Elias' mom is the commandant. I did not know that when I started the book. So when it was revealed in the chapter, I was like, whoa. I don't know what the hell happened to Elias' mom, but I really want to know. Right now, she's really just this antagonist. She's just mean. We get one moment where she kind of shows a little smidgen of humanity. At the end, when Elias is in the jail, he's gonna be executed. He has this little heart to heart, if you could call it that, with his mother. She tells him that she didn't just leave him in the desert to die. She left him with a woman so he would live and then she decided on her way home never mind that was stupid i want to kill him again and i want more backstory on exactly what traumatizing incident in her childhood ruined her grandfather i know he's harsh but I, there's something in me that likes him i like her dad i like how he supports his grandson i like how he believes elias right off the bat when he's like marcus cheated this happened this happened this happened and the augers are like no i don't think so and grandfather is like yeah, really? Are you sure? You looked in Karis's mind and saw that she didn't sabotage my grandson. They're like, well, you know, the mind's a complicated thing. And the grandfather's like, so that's a no. <gasps> okay. And it touched me because he doesn't have anyone there for him. He doesn't have any family. And this grandfather cares. I mean, we get a little glimpse into the fact that Miss Kettis has some daddy issues. Daddy never was satisfied with her because she was a girl. And no matter how strong she was and how good she was, she was never his heir. But that doesn't seem like enough to make her the cruel, vicious, scary nightmare woman that she is. I don't know what's going on with that tattoo on her either. Is that something that's seeping the life out of her? Maybe every time she works with Nightbringer, he gives her a new portion of the tattoo. And maybe he's like, this tattoo will make you more wisdom and powerful, but like it also sucks out your soul. This is a very far-fetched theory, but like I'm rolling with it. Let's talk about the augers. So like at first I was creeped out. The augers scared me. They're like they're creepy vampire humans that live forever and they can't die and they can read minds. Basically really ugly versions of Edward Cullen. But as we went on, like, I, I like Kane. There's this moment after the second trial when Elias came really close to dying and Kane is like, your I see you're healed from the second trial. And Elias goes, yeah, no, thanks to you. And Kane is like, the trials aren't meant to be easy, Elias. That's why they're called the trials. <laughs> And he's like kind of on our side. It's like, whose side are they on? One of the huge questions the book leaves us with is, who the F is that woman auger? I feel like she has to be so insignificant. Why did she let Lyle live? Is it is it secretly Lyle's mother? I don't know how humans turn into augers. I don't know how the augers happen. Do they happen one at a time? Or was 14 people just at augers? Were they just born augers? How do augers happen? Do gods come down and be like, auger, auger, augers? <laughs> Were they originally humans? I want to know more about them. Why is there only one woman? And does it correlate with why there's only one woman per generation of black class students? I don't know. There's so many effing questions. My running crazy theory right now is that maybe it was related to Laia. <laughs> There's a lot of Harry Potter-esque moments and it just, I loved them. Like that moment when we come back from the first trial and Elias runs in just on time, but he's carrying Helene's body that's covered in blood, like she's practically dead. And her mom and her sisters are like screaming as they like run down to see her. I was having flashbacks to the end of the Triwizard Tournament with Cedric. Then we got this whole storyline with Marcus and Zach. I just, I felt so bad for Zach. I, I didn't want him to die at the end and I can't believe he actually did. That third trial was just so insane. I thought it wasn't real. Like, I thought that they would bring back the people afterward because they have the power to. This could all just be an exercise and then afterward they can bring them back to life. But they just let them all die and kill their friends. I just, I don't understand that. Why? It's just mean. I don't It's just, it's, it's insane. These trials are insane. They're, they're horrible. These aren't just trials. These are like death matches for no reason. Now this power to heal that Helene has. Interesting. And I wonder if it's because she was so close to death and the augers healed her that it woke up this power inside of her. That's my running theory that if you're dying and the augers heal you, maybe you can tap into some sort of magic that the augers tap into. It doesn't seem like the augers sing. 
to hear of people. They just don't look like Sigurd. The efforts and jinns and wraths and stuff. There's that whole story about the jinns and the Nightbringer is like the king jinn and the jinns are like locked in a forest somewhere. We've just scraped the surface of that mythology. Efforts? I feel like I've heard of those in Teen Wolf. The place that I've heard most of these names before is Teen Wolf. Now Marcus is emperor and all and we can't possibly leave him like that. How can this possibly be one book? Not only have we not found Darren, the main purpose that drove Lyia throughout the whole book, but Marcus, the antagonist, is the emperor. We can't, we can't stand for that shit. This isn't over by a long shot. So Darren is now in Azkaban slash cough prison, and Elias is gonna lead us there. How funny would it have been if Helen came with them? It would have been like this weird trio, both like Elias, and been uncomfortable, but fun. We also have this whole mystery about Elias parents. We don't know exactly what happened to them. We don't see them die, we don't see the sister die, so they could possibly, in retrospect, be alive somehow. We have this whole thing going on with the cook and she was part of the resistance and she knew Laia's father and I got the weird impression that maybe she and Laia's father had an affair but the cook is older than that her parents would be. Or maybe the cook is related to the father, maybe she's like a sister or something. We have this one line, I believe Laia dropped somewhere in the book, that her parents were always fighting with each other. So maybe there was something happening in her family life and maybe there was some sort of affair. Laia has an older sister and an older brother so her parents could be a little older. Supposedly they were all tortured at cough and killed but maybe they're still alive at cough. Maybe we'll find one of them at cough when we go there to rescue Darren. Who do you think of the resistance is working for the commandant or is working with the commandant and doesn't even realize it? Like, I feel like Mazin is a bad seed. I don't trust that man at all. The whole time I didn't trust him and I was just like, Laia, why are you so blindingly trusting him? Because I guess that's all she could really do. She was in a position where she could only believe him and if she didn't believe him, she didn't have anything else to do. She didn't know where to go from there. We also have no idea what's going on with this blacksmith Telemann that makes the really strong, excellent blade. What did Laia go to ask him at the end? He gave her the blade, but we didn't see what she wanted him to do. How could this be one? I really like that blacksmith. I like how he talked to her and how he respected her. The respect he showed for her was really refreshing. I loved the character of Izzy. She was a much needed friend in the slave zone. Watching Laia be a slave was so tense and heartbreaking. <sighs> there was nothing we could do to help her. And it was so... Hard. I love, love, love that night that they sneak out to go to the moon dance festival. All the reminiscing and nostalgia that Laia feels is just so nice. Then seeing that from Elias's point of view. And then when they danced, it was just so nice to see them just being normal humans and kind of interacting like a regular contemporary book couple would be able to. When she gave Izzy that moon cake for the first time and she's like, have you tried this? And seeing them enjoy that together was so nice. When Helene won her trial and she got that metal shirt, that living metal shirt that's like the metal Mask. I was like, no, do not put that on. This shirt is gonna melt with your body. So now she has just like a silver body now. Why don't you just turn yourself into a robot? Cause that looks like where you're going. That's where you're headed right now. What is wrong with these people? Why must you make your face a mask? It's a scare tactic to scare people into obedience. It's just to show their rank. They literally, they're turning themselves into robots. That's what they're doing and it's not cool. I love the wording of this one scene during the second trial when they're at the top of the tower. Helene and Elias are tied together and Elias gets pushed off and he realizes that he didn't die. He's like, Helene had yanked on my belt. She must've attached the rope then which means she's on the other end, which means if the soldiers throw her over it, I'm still dangling like a comatose spider. We both fall hard. I just love that. Like a comatose spider. It's just beautiful. I'm so happy that Elias's mask hasn't meshed with his face because it was just scaring me the whole time. Like, stop leaving that mask on. Like, I guess the whole idea of it from a writer's perspective is like it's an actual visual metaphor of how this school turns these kids into like emotionless metal robots. And when she took it off and it had like spokes into his neck because it was trying to meld onto- ooh, ooh. That part when they come back from the moon festival and the commandant is just standing outside. <gasps> My god, the gasps. It was like gasp after gasp after gasp. I did not want Laia to be like de-eyed. I love the part at the end where Elias is chained up but he finally has found peace. I love when Marcus comes in and he overpowers him and he gets a knife to his throat and he's like, I'm not gonna kill you but I just wanted to show you. I could if I wanted to. So sit down with your little cocky ass behavior. And after that we go to Elias' point of view and we know she's planned something and I was expecting some sort of Pirates of the Caribbean escape. Okay. And it was so Pirates of the Caribbean. I mean, it was different because there were explosions. But it was Pirates of the Caribbean. It was awesome. I loved it. I was proud. And I'm so excited to see where it goes in the next book because I'm sure she's going to be signed for another book. I'd love to hear your favorite parts, your favorite characters. My favorite characters are Helene and Izzy, other than our two main characters. I like them too. I think they're both really strong, interesting people. So we have to see the Commandant die. Like, we didn't see her die. How
How could this be one book? How? None of our antagonists died. Like, they basically won. We ran away and escaped. Everyone's still alive and kicking. So, it's not over. Please share your thoughts. I'm Christine. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you next time. Bye!